The Diplomatic International, the only prime time program explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm the host, Natalia Humenyuk. And that's what we have prepared for you tonight. The arson attack on former Central Bank Chief Valeria Gontrova, which saw her house burned down and suspicions surrounding the return of Ihir Kolomoisky, an oligarch who previously owned Privat Bank prior to its nationalization. A preview of the first interview with recently released Crimean filmmaker Oleg Sansov. A scandal brewing in U.S.-Ukrainian relations ahead of President Zelensky's trip to New York to meet U.S. President Donald Trump for the first time. The Steinmeier formula and the future of the Donbass conflict, including exclusive comments made by the new Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, and a peek at a Kormansky documentary covering Russia's new generation of protesters. A series of attacks related to the former head of the National Bank, Valeria Gontereva, took place over the last few months, which culminated in her Ukrainian house being burned uh, down earlier this week. Valeria Gontereva herself currently lives at works in London, and she was also hit by a car in August. At the same time, Ukraine is witnessing the return of, to the spotlight and the growing influence of the prominent oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky, whose former bank, private bank, was nationalized in December 2000. 16. There are a number of the courts taking place. It will be interesting to see how the new government will deal with the notorious oligarch. Will it confront him or look for compromise? Uh, we also would like to explain the situation to our international audience, in particular those who are concerned, as we know that international organizations, for instance, those like EBRD, say that they remain vigilant over Ukraine's private bank case. And we have a brilliant discussion. A brilliant brilliant panel in our studio to discuss the case. It includes Ivan Verstuk, a journalist, political correspondent, who also is you know, following in details Ukrainian politics and the economics. Um, Dmitro Nataluka, who is the MP from Servant of the People and is a chairman of the Economic Committee uh, in the Ukrainian Parliament, and Sergei Fursa, a specialist of sales of debt securities at Dragon Capital, and also analyst uh, explaining economy, uh, active commentator of what's going on in uh, Ukrainian politics and economy. So great to have you. Thank you, yeah, thank thank you for having us. Uh, probably I should explain, maybe ask you, Ivan, uh, if you would. If there would be, a, I don't know, a foreign expert or anybody would ask, like, I hear, I see all those signs. There is something with Gontareva House. There is a court. There is another small, tiny Kiev court which makes takes some decision on um, Privat Bank. How would you explain what's going on? And, of course, Mr. Kolomoisky is back and uh, running around, giving a huge amount of interviews. Well, from my point of view, <clears throat> what we are experiencing is quite a clear revenge of the pro Kolomoisky stance in politics and uh, also in some state-owned companies. When I saw him uh, at the YES conference this last weekend, he was in a very cozy mood talking to journalists and uh, making sure everyone believes that he is feeling comfortable, that he has influence over president's office, that he has influence over Ukrainian politics. These are the messages that Kolomoisky wants uh, to put uh, into people's ears. And it's not a secret for anyone that uh, Kolomoisky uh, he, he, he clearly has a negative attitude to Gontareva because she was the one who was standing behind the nationalization of Kolomoisky's bank, Privat Bank, Ukraine's largest uh, uh, financial institution. Uh, this is pretty worrying, uh, 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 and uh, when, when I was talking to a number of foreign uh, diplomats uh, from all over the world and asked them what they think about this revenge of Kolomoisky, what they think about the appearance of Kolomoisky during the Yes conference, they were very concerned. They were, we were saying, like, you're joking and making selfies with him, and this is the man who stole $5.5 .5 billion from the taxpayers. So the, the, the problem is quite uh, essential. So, of course, there are this uh, symbolic, uh, not just symbolic, but there is a symbolic appearance of presence of Ihor Kolomoisky. Uh, but, Metro, what would you say on particularly on the um, economic committee work and, uh, you know, how you gonna, you know, more or less say that you, you, you're acting independently? Me, myself, independently from I, I Mr. Speak Kolomoisky. I'm the servant of the people, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's not that we feel any kind of uh, pressure from, from the Kolomoisky or whatsoever. 
Uh, I think that we should not underestimate the, the private bank case, but we shouldn't overestimate it as well. And uh, the thing is that it's an internal dispute, of course. It attracts a lot of attention, but exclusively because uh, Privat Bank is a super company in terms of uh, the monopoly, but also because Kolomoisky is a superstar. He has been, always been a trend maker and a newsmaker. And uh, people feel themselves very interested uh, about the news. So um, me, personally, I don't consider it to be a, a very global threat to the economy, because uh, if we take the, the reforms right, if we take the, the laws that are being passed through the parliament, if we take concession, if we take privatization, if we um, take uh, the, the, the new lease um, procedures, uh, if we take the, the, the privatization of the space industry, um, we want to create a lot of checks and balances in order to not allow this kind of panic influence um, the, the, the voters. Because as far as I see it now, uh, this issue is being over-dramatized. And uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's rather fair, because from our, point, uh, from our stand, um, the servant of the people would do everything to keep quiet and calm down the voters and to, uh, um, to guarantee the, the, the financial and economic stability of Ukraine. We'll go into details that he... Uh, not details, but I would argue that, uh, on my point of view, private bank now is the biggest risk factor for Ukraine economy. Because Ukraine uh, macroeconomical stability, economical growth was that we have seen for the last three years is based on IMF program. And uh, private bank nationalization was also part of pre uh, IMF program. It was one of the uh, best performing, if I could say uh, that way, reforms that we have seen. It was very important, and all our uh, creditors always figure out that it's very important to pass it through and go uh, further. And when I mean go further, I mean that they expect that 5.5 billion dollars uh, to come back to Ukrainian taxpayers. And that's why this is uh, some uh, just a compromise with on the case of private bank, it's a red line. If Ukraine to cross this red line, it could be destroy uh, IMF program. If IMF program to be destroyed, even take into account all these very good laws that now uh, voting in Urkhon are really good, especially we, uh, from our side we expect land reform, maybe it's most expected reform ever. But even if all these reforms to be done, uh, if we put on the other hand destruct, destructive result of, I, of losing IMF, these all reforms wouldn't help. And, what IMFs and now that's why IMF uh, send the signals. State Department says the signals. EBRD send the signals. That, okay, guys, we see we're looking for we're looking at you. We're looking forward for solution, but solution for from our point of view, it's not some compromise with oligarch. And maybe uh, the reason is because uh, you can't be. You can't uh, move forward. You can't do reforms. You can't reform. You can't reform your country dealing with oligarchs. Because when we're talking about what was the biggest one of the biggest problem in Ukraine in the current economy, it's oligarchization, and every reform pushing you to fight with oligarchs. Every reform. You can't do any reform without finding that there is a problem and on the other side there is some oligarch. So if you make a compromise with one of them, it's like compromise with devil. It's a deal with devil. It will destroy, destroy all reform agenda. At, and at the very beginning it will destroy your macroeconomical stability because you're going to lose IMF. You say, um, you, you know, that it could be over-dramatized, but uh, for investment, for, for having the trust into the new Ukrainian government, the symbolic things really matters. And for instance, the, uh, apart from appearance of Mr. Kolomoisky, there are some clear things. That for, in for instance, Metro Dubilet, uh, the top manager of former private bank, is a member of the cabinet. And these, there are a number of the things. So what are you going to do to show and demonstrate, for instance, uh, that there is the fight against monopoly, there is something which really would uh, help to uh, investigate Mr. Kolomoisky instead of investigating, for instance, the deals of uh, former head of National Bank, Gontareva. Uh, we also know that concerns are because of having some pe uh, having in the radar uh, people close to Kolomoisky, li like, for instance, NMP Dubinsky and, and people like that, who are who were voted as a, um, constituency representatives, but still are servant of the people, uh, members of the faction. 
Um, let us focus on the word compromise. Um, and I, I want to be us very clear on the fact that who is having this compromise with whom. As far as I know, uh, as of today, uh, neither Zelensky nor the Cabinet of Ministers are not holding any negotiations on the reprivatization of private bank. So this is, of course, not a merely uh, a legal issue and a legal case. Again, as I said before, it has been uh, provided with some uh, added uh, uh, spotlight, but only because um, of the kind of the company which Privat Bank is and the kind of the personality which Kolomoisky is. Um, the, the other thing, uh, which is also very important, is that we should be very careful uh, on saying that we are vigilant about something and saying that we will uh, be very carefully looking into what's happening. Uh, because that means that we want to be impartial and objective, aren't we? And if we want to stay impartial and objective, this is a legal case following the legal procedures, and we don't want any push or any stress on it. Uh, so for international companies, international institutions, whoever they are, and uh, whichever impact on the Ukrainian economy they might have, uh, I won't be sure that it's rather correct to kind of push the Ukrainian government into a certain direction in this case. If you trust us, if you trust uh, the reboot of the Ukrainian system, of the Ukrainian uh, Rada, of the Ukrainian Cabinet of Ministers, of the, Ukra of the Ukrainian General Prosecutor, and uh, of the Ukrainian courts, um, we want you to stay impartial as well. And we want you to have this kind of uh, legal investigations on all levels. This is the first point. The second point, in terms of, of, of the signals that we're uh, having. Look, I, I don't quite remember the last time when RADA has been working on Friday and have been working until the very evening. I don't quite remember uh, 29 laws being passed in, in, in two weeks with the president tomorrow, no, the day after tomorrow probably, going to the states with those kind of laws. It's an incredible result. And it's an incredible signal that we are ready and we are going to that. That's a signal, of course, and nobody wants to undermine the work of RADA. You are not just representing the whole RADA as well. But we are speaking about a pe peculiar case which can undermine all the good things. Yes, I guess and what do I mean? When you're talking about compromise, it's not renationalization or privatization of private bank. Compromise, what Kolomoisky needed, he needed to solve his problem in London court. Because his assets are frozen now, because uh, state uh, looking to come take back their money. That's why state, in Minfin, previous Minfin, Minister, fin, fin, Minister of Finance, Minister of Finance uh, with private bank, with national bank, went to London court. Uh, and there, yes, when we're talking about London court, we say that we trust to this institution. But li listen, people who are sitting in this room or who are watching, nobody is trusting to Ukrainian courts. Nobody. And the trust is just a zero level. And I think even... Uh, 400 MPs that sit in Rada, nobody trusts to Ukrainian court. That's why when we're talking about what we expect to see, we understand that the decision of Ukrainian court, it's not going to be the decision of some judge. Sorry, but not. It's going to be the decision of presidential office. But it won't be translated from presidential office. We understand what they, we will understand what decisions they make by this judge decision. And that's why everybody is talking about, and to Zelensky. That's, uh, everybody's trying to send a signal to Zelensky. That's why on Friday night with, when uh, IMF was on a meeting with Zelensky, they discussed private bank. Not because uh, people were interested in, do you, what do you think, show what court decision should be made. No, they understand that in office of, uh, the decision is going to be made in office of the president. I, I, I one, one important thing I want to add to what he said is uh, when I had a conversation with Kolomoisky last week, uh, what I understood from what he said is that he needs money. He needs money now. Uh, his uh, wealth is estimated at one billion dollars, uh, which is uh, not that much uh, in case you want to finance more political projects, in case you want to buy some asset from the privatization program that Ukraine's new prime minister announced, uh, in case you need uh, to buy political loyalty. For all these things, Kolomoisky needs money. And his claim to take $2 billion from the uh, finance minister, from the uh, government-owned private bank, is uh, uh, probably uh, an invitation to negotiate the way who, get, who can get those
those, those money. But of course, his claim about this money doesn't stand to very basic fact checking because there was no any money in Privat Bank when it was uh, when it was nationalized. That's a, that's a very important point. Uh, and I even asked uh, Kolomoisky if he wants to buy any state-owned asset, uh, which will be put up on privatization. He said he's considering those, op those options. Though, <clears throat> from my experience of following Kolomoisky's activity, you know, you don't, in Ukraine, unfortunately, you don't need to own a property mm -hmm. to make fortune on it. He can just install loyal uh, top executives in a state-owned company like uh, say Centra Nerg or some else and make money just like this. With that I agree absolutely and uh, uh, we've been talking a lot of times about the thing that in Ukraine all the um, state-owned enterprises, almost all of them, are already uh, privatized uh, as much as through top management. That's pretty much it. So in order to officially privatize it means just to, form uh, to formalize it. But what Sergei said, another thing, and it's very important, is de facto, he said that there is no judiciary in this country. Uh, yes, it's true. <laughs> I guess. So the first point is that there is no uh, legislation in the uh, legislative branch in this country because everybody says that the Rada does not de decide itself. No, 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 no. This is very, very important. And now we're hearing, and now we're hearing that the courts are absent. They're not autonomous, and basically, it's not a, a decision of a ju of a judge, but of the office administration. Do you reckon this is the right signal you want to send to the diplomats and everything that that Ukraine is basically <laughs> being managed and regulated by a single? man in this country? Are we going back again to the Yanukovych time? Oh, it's my question to you because I, only one message I want to send is the truth. And the truth is there is no independent judgment in Ukraine. It's a truth, and we all know it. Why, why we should to send some not correct uh, uh, messages to our friends who support us for the last five years, just saying, keep in support us. We will negotiate somehow with oligarchs, but keep in sending money to us. The Please support us. Do not invest in Ukraine, because he considers there are no courts in this country. Thank you. Uh, when we're talking about investors and what stops them from uh, uh, investing in Ukraine, we're always asking them, it's rule of law. It's a 90% of investors tell us there is no rule of law in this country. So it's not a surprise for even for investors. And maybe it's not about like how you frame that, uh, but rather whether, whether there is a trust. You know, the trust something, it's very easy to lose. Where well, is the moment we start building it? So do you believe in the Ukrainian uh, judge? court system and that the Ukrainian, all the Ukrainian trials are fair, in particular on these economic cases. I do give them a potential. Let's stay on that. that. Because that's, that's the same uh, thing you, get, you should ask about the parliament, the cabinet of ministers, uh, any kind of central, um, central organs and authorities uh, which are still now under the, the government's control. Uh, no, because you give credit to some new, uh, new administration, new parliament, I could give credit to new parliament. But if you have old judgment system, why I will give credit to them? It's all the same old judges that, that behaved uh, like crazy for the last 10 years or 20 years, who knows? And who stops uh, our foreign investors, our foreign friends from investing in Ukraine. We all knew it. If we will form new judgment system, if we will pass due judgment reform, I would be ready to give them a credit. In that case, yes, but currently, no, no way. But then again, we go back, if we stay on this position, uh, I, I can accept it, but then we should accept the following conspiracy theories that uh, out of 254 members of parliament from uh, the um, Servant of the People Party, half of them are either stupid or uh, psych uh, psychologically unstable, and another half are either uh, bought by oligarchs by Kolomoisky, by Firtash, by someone else. Then we have the Bogdan in the president's administration who is super pro Kolomoisky. And then where we're going far from, are we going far from that? Where are we going from I that? I do not see any connection between <laughs> my <laughs> point and point of so, <laughs> piece of... Uh, the question is really, you know, it's still the job probably of the party or somebody you know, with, with the laws you're doing uh, to prove that the, the system you're building is uh, efficient and trusted. And there are, for instance, whether would you, you join to say what would be those laws and legislation that would be needed that there won't be the uh, preference to any oligarch in the country. Yeah. Well, the, the, there are some just clear examples uh, of uh, how Kolomoisky is being 
uh, treated specially by the government. Let's take uh, the airlines, international U Ukraine International Airlines. It usually gets the best time spots at Borispol Airport. No other company, whether even it's a big European carrier or small local low cost, can compete with international, Ukraine International Airlines. And this, this, this just one example. So I don't think Kolomoisky's uh, influence on Ukraine's business scene and Ukraine's political scene is a conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, that's a, the, a reality we have to deal with. Though it's not a reason to say that Ukraine's not worth investing, that Ukraine has no hope, and it won't grow economically. It will. Even China, which is pretty corrupt, growth 6.5% a year. Well, Ukraine will grow, but it will grow much better and faster if people like Kolomoisk and other oligarchs would be demonopolized, oligarchized, and put on the level playing field. You have your point on that, and I agree with that absolutely. Well, uh, well, I mean, if you allow me. Sure. Uh, he is a monopolist. He is an oligarch. By no means I'm, I'm defending him. I'm just saying that there is a special case, which is basically a legal suit. Uh, which is not only on the Ukrainian level, but also on an international level. They have courts in, in England, if I'm not mistaken, and courts in other jurisdictions. And uh, I just don't want us to ever overemphasize its, um, its uh, importance. That's pretty much it. Uh, I also should mention that uh, w while presenting the different sides, uh, we should also uh, would like to present the quote of uh, Mr. Kolomoisky, in particular on those negotiations with the state about Privat Bank, whether they are taking place. I've only read about negotiations in the press. There aren't actually any negotiations or even any consultations going on. We aren't going to leave the new owner of Privat Bank alone. We're interested in Privat Bank, but if the regulatory process is difficult and causes turbulence in the financial markets, no big deal, we can discard it. Everything is for sale, and everything can be bought in business. Still, uh, apart from the economy, we have these cases like the uh, Valeria Gontreva house being burned uh, down earlier this week, uh, which of course quite a... Uh, Quite a concerning event. Uh, we also would like to uh, give a word to, to show the quote of Valeria Hondereva. My colleague uh, talked to her a bit earlier this week. I suspect I know who did this, because it's been, you understand, more than a year, maybe, as he's been threatening me. So that's what I understand. Recently, Portnov joined him. I don't know the motive. I read today in the Financial Times that they're working on a settlement. I don't know how I would bother them in settling. I haven't worked for the central bank for two and a half years. There have already been one, two, three incidents of revenge. Now, today, they've burned my house. My entire life was there. My family photographs. This was my house. All my friends have called me already. Zelensky called me as well. And the president's administration has sent out a press release calling for investigation. And, of course, Mr. Kolomoisky denies all the allegation. That's his quote. I'm currently in talks with my lawyers. We're in the process of preparing a lawsuit. Of course, she's a Ukrainian citizen. So why should I chase her in the London courts? So still, it's a, it's a very, very loud story. Uh, of course, the president condemned, the, foreign, uh, the minister of interior condemned. However, I've heard some of the comments of different MPs, including the servant of the people who are saying, like, why the internationals are so bothered about this? What would you say on that? Because, uh, indeed, Valeria Gontereva is quite a top uh, Top politician used to, a civil servant uh, used to be, but very, very much respected uh, by the international partners. I mean, it's a tragedy, obviously, and it's a crime, and it should be investigated. That no, uh, no doubts about it. So, and uh, I think the president made it very much clear, as much as the minister of the interior. Um, th there are some suspicions, and but they are alleged. Uh, let's not forget about it because she has been seeking for political asylum for quite a long time. And there are people who are trying to connect the dots, basically. And, uh, but that again, that is, those are conspiracies. Uh, either believe them or not, let's wait until the result of the investigation. This pretty much. Until today, I think that uh, all the prosecutional system, the, the, the police system, should be focused on this very special case because it's a, a matter of the image of the whole country. Uh, you were asking why it's so important, uh, because uh, when we see attack on a Gontreva, and people in this country do not like Gontreva, let's be honest, but at the same time, 
she's very well respected among investment society, among banking society, and among our foreign investors and creditors. And what's how IMF see it? They do not see that it's just attack of some retired person. Uh, they see that it's attack on the independence of the national bank. It's very important because what Gondreva did, she did a great job on the, as a head of national bank. She did a great reform that one. Uh, when people ask him what are best reform, performing reforms in Ukraine, banking system reform. And uh, this it is position not only about for Sergei Fursa, but its position of international IMF, uh, our international investors. That's why it's so important. Because if someday uh, you will let it go and forget about it, she already retired person, nobody cares. All other ref reformers who now making reforms will understand that they will, when they left, job, when they lost their security, le high level of security of the people who are servant of the people, uh, they could be attacked by any oligarchs. And they understand that every day making reforms, they have a critical connections with oligarchs, fighting with oligarchs. And if they follow the state interest, they will have a very bad relation with the oligarchs. And all other reforms will understand if they could do it with the Valeria Gontareva, who one of the top, topest guy of top reforms, that will could do it with anybody else. Uh, what, what I'm concerned about is that Gontreva, she, right, uh, right now, she does a research work at London School of Economics, which means she talks to investment community of London, to local businesses. And London is like an investment hub for Europe, for emerging markets. And uh, therefore, Ukraine gets an image of being a highly um, violent and political and stable country. And now Gontre will, will probably pay a visit. She was invited by the US Senate to witness on what was done to her in London and then to her relatives here in Kiev, all this violence. Uh, and Ukraine's expecting uh, US Congress to vote on uh, sanctions against Russia. Ukraine's expecting European Union to vote on sanctions against Russia. And now all these people uh, will get, are getting a message that Ukraine's top reformer, which uh, has done more to the banking sector than uh, all the previous central bank governors, she's been, she's been oppressed and she, is, uh, uh, she, she, she might be considered an asylum, which is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it means that the, the situation is critical. Uh, no one will be, will be willing to take any kind of important government job and push for this uh, complicated reforms anymore if uh, they, they look at what uh, is being done to Gontrio. So it's very important for uh, Ukraine's um, uh, police and prosecutors to investigate the case unless they want uh, uh, to get uh, uh, one more case which will, will be remembered by politicians in the West and investment community and will be brought up to, uh, each time the discussion goes about rule of law in Ukraine. So it's, it's, it's very important. I wouldn't underestimate the Guantareva case. It's very, very important. Vitro, of course, you do not represent law enforcement investigations. However, as a chairman of the Committee of the Economy, what do you think you and the MPs should do in order to, you know, to improve the situation, uh, the image, or at least show that some of the things are just unacceptable, unacceptable, and you know, apart from the regrets, you know, you still have the legislation, you still can, you know, uh, quite be, you know, creative and inventive in order to prove otherwise. Any proposals? That's up to you. <laughs> That's what we're expecting. Uh, well, I, I think it would be fair to say that um, even the servant of the people as a party um, is not very uh, ho homogeneous. Uh, it's, um, it's a representation of people with different uh, views and different aspects, including the economic reforms of Ms. Hontario. Uh, what we are um, united about is the state interest and uh, the state interest and the image of Ukraine uh, which might be damaged by this case is of course uh, of great importance but this kind of damage is also influenced by the personality of Ms. Hontareva and by the results of her reforms and uh, I'm not sure we might find a single and a unified position within the party that's uh, basically a pool for debates um, 
For example, if you take the Crimean case and the elections on the 8th of September uh, on the territory of Crimea, uh, Sevastopol and Simferopol, uh, the Verkhovna Rada has been united into sending this message that we are against it because that's a level of national interest that nobody agrees about. But then when you have uh, any kind of decisions that are rather personal and uh, are taken from different points of view, then you have different opinions. And um, I, I, I definitely will consider your uh, your proposition and think about it and being creative. Maybe we'll have an internal discussion about this. But as of today, um, I'm not sure we're having any kind of uh, idea. And from you, uh, to rounding up this discussion, which is a bit broader, uh, it's not just about this week's events, what would you expect from the uh, Economic Committee of RADA, uh, which would be the sign to ensure that Mr. Kolomoisky doesn't have his strong grip over the Ukrainian economy or an insecurity of the National Bank? I don't see the economy... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know because uh, we can't address yeah. sometimes, we, we're not talking uh, to Mr. Kolomoisky. But when we're talking about RADA, for instance, I would... <laughs> Would, would be happy to, to not see with, when Kolomoisky is saying something in an interview and it became a law in uh, two weeks. I don't want to see such things. I don't want to see that... Uh, if it's super good law. <laughs> if, oh, oh, yes, Kolomoisky is a guy who presents super good ideas not for... in two weeks, I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three weeks. Three weeks. Uh, I, I, I do not want to see that uh, Mr. Kolomoisky can control state-owned enterprise like in old good times and get a benefit from it, and everybody is happy. I can't agree with it. And I think Rada should also, people in Rada, if you AMP of several people who used to say that Poroshenko is a corrupt guy, and his friend uh, Kananenko was like a guy who controls Central America, I think it is completely the same story, but now another K uh, controls. You see the K in, um, uh, in some movies. There's a different K who controls the same situation. I don't want to, Ukrainians to accept it as a normal, normal situation. It's unnormal, and they should focus on it. They should tell to the president, tell to the president, guys, it's not okay when oligarchs take a benefit from state-owned enterprise. And Ivan, uh, for the final comment uh, for our audience, what would you suggest to watch out in the whole case, in particular of the private bank? Well, because it's quite getting a bit complex, so where people should watch? Uh, uh, there is one uh, um, very important indicator of what's what, on what's going to be done to private bank and other state-owned banks. banks. Uh, they're about to get new supervisory boards, which control uh, their management, with, which control their financial situation. And uh, Alexander Dubinsky, an MP with Servant of the People Party, who is believed to be a Kolomoisky's man, will be in charge of... Uh, commission that uh, puts these supervisory boards on place. And this is, this is a risk because we, we need to have very transparent and experienced people in finance who work for the state-owned banks, for the private bank. And if we see more Kolomoisky people in this process, if we see Kolomoisky people in the supervisory board of private bank, then it's a very bad sign. So let's, let's follow what's going on with private bank and state-owned banks in terms of supervisory boards. If I could hop on to sure. this argument, which I completely agree with, um, in fact... And, and would you maybe respond? Or to <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we are, in fact, uh, being cancelling uh, a list of state-owned enterprises that cannot be privatised. And this is uh, one, the first step of a very important reform and privatisation, corporatization of state-owned uh, enterprises. Uh, a lot of them, all of them, or most of them are inefficient. And uh, we want uh, the state to be managed uh, adequately and to be ad administered uh, adequately as well and to be efficient. The second thing, we cancelled the, the, the commission for privatisation and um, we are transferring this function to the committee and to the uh, executive. Then we're having this uh, concession law, uh, which allows not only to privatise or to lease, but also to invest money into an object of infrastructure such as a port or a road that are being transferred um, for the management to an international investor who can attract not only money but best, uh, best, best practices in management and uh, uh, other things. Um, what Sir Hees, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, Ivan said, um, is of course important as well. Um, I, I, don't, I, I didn't take part in, in the appointment of any kind of officials to any kind of commissions. Um, but I, I think that um, they're having an internal discussion within the financial committee. Uh, I'm not 
sure about the arguments of uh, pro and contra of that discussion. Um, I will look into it. Uh, but I think that uh, there's been an election and this guy has been elected and uh, hopefully he will do a good job. If not, he will just be uh, removed from that place and reach in change. That's uh, pretty much it. Uh, so I don't see any way to solve the whole Kolomoisky issue and explain it within uh, one show. But thanks a lot for clarifications and for your uh, for the discussion and the argument. So that was Serhi Fursa, who is specialist of sales of debt securities at Dragon Capital. Mitrona Talucha, a chairman of the Economic Committee in Rada from the Servant of the People. And the uh, journalist Ivan Verstuk from Enve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alexinsov, one of the most prominent political prisoners, his name had been mentioned numerous times in particularly this studio and not like just that. And this week we had Oleg sitting in this studio uh, giving his first interview to Hromatske. He promised that while he was still in prison and kept his promise. So that's our exclusive. I wasn't alone. There were a lot of guys who didn't agree with what was going on. Some were more active, some were passive. It was clear that there was a lot of pressure from the Russian occupiers and collaborators, those that joyfully greeted the Russians. Some passively accepted them, considering that life would improve under Russian rule, that they would get richer, and that they didn't really care about the politics. Those who actively resisted, they had serious fights and they risked a lot in terms of their health, freedom and life. A few people just disappeared without sign and some were murdered. Some servicemen were killed. It was a very heavy mood. Some people had this feeling that Kyiv abandoned us. They said this out loud. But a lot of Crimean activists weren't at the Euromaidan. But I was for most of it, and I understood very well that the events there were very profound and sharp relief, and that there were a lot of problems in Kyiv when the new government took power. This was a game that was hard to win, practically impossible. Putin chose a very good moment to attack. If he'd done so a month later, it wouldn't have worked. When I was first sent to Lefortovo, I told my side of the story to my lawyer. And then I went to court. I can talk about it every time. It doesn't cause me any moral pain. Things like this don't hurt. It's just that our people who suffered a great deal more, who were tortured more, who suffered far more moral and physical humiliation. I went and gave my statement because that's evidence against the FSB of their actions for the Hague Tribunal. Evil must be punished. There were FSB personnel and former SBU employees who crossed over to their side. They were currying favor to be hired for a new service. What advice would you give as a person who lived five years in prison? What would you like the relatives of political prisoners to do? I can only speak for myself. No need to bury yourself. That is first and foremost. I didn't bury myself. I have not lost a day in prison. I always knew that we would win. I always knew that we would be set free. I didn't get depressed at all. There are difficult moments when it is very hard. But they are rare, they're short-lived, and no one sees them. And so I tried to think positively and have a positive attitude inside myself. What would you say to Crimeans today? Those who support the integrity of Ukraine? And those who supported the annexation at the time? Some of them think differently now. Everything split up there at that moment. Half of my friends are for Ukraine, half for Russia. My family split up too. The split went through the entire Crimea. Those who couldn't stay there left. 
They left not because it became much worse to live there. It just didn't get better to live there, as it was promised. This is the thing. And whoever wanted left because it's very difficult to live in such an atmosphere. I managed to feel it two months before the annexation, after the referendum. I felt it thicken, that asphyxiation. And in five years, it only got worse. I will never recognize Crimea as part of Russia. That goes without saying. The same thing with the Donbass republics. They are artificial satellites of the Russian Federation. Of course, they are also part of Ukraine. I will never recognize the separatist sentiments or the desire to join Russia. We are a united country. These territories have rejected us and we will never accept that. Definitely I have pro-European views. I tell many people why I went to your Maidan and why I adhere to this position. I want to live how people live in Europe, so that we become a European country and live according to their principles and then according to their standards, life standards and so on. I do not want to live as they live in Russia, which is heading to the Soviet Union. Secondly, my attitude to the state is simple. We, the people, are the state. One has to understand that. Those who manage it are our managers, to whom we give the authority to solve specific problems, specific issues. And they are responsible to us. We are not their slaves, not their servants, not their subordinates. They are our subordinates. How do the Russians who are in prison see the so-called fraternal war against Ukraine? Russians? Most see it as the propaganda shows them. They all perceive it in its pure form. Well, not 80 percent, maybe 70. The sample was specific, but all the same, these are also people who watch the TV, and they believe in what it says. They have such a hatred for Ukraine, even contempt for Ukraine. For Europe, for America, it is very strong, inundated with it every minute. The problem of Ukraine, this can be seen with me or any other examples from the past, is that people wait for a messiah to come and solve all of the problems for you. As soon as you understand that you have no one to hope for except for yourself and live like that with such a philosophy everything will be fine in your life i've been living for a long time hoping only for myself the crimean problem arose among other things due to the fact that the language issue was being resolved very clumsily due to the fact that ukrainization came from the top and at times was carried out using utilitarian methods not quite correctly and this caused a rejection of crimeans to the ukrainian language to the ukrainian culture To watch and read the full version of interview with Alexei and so go to our webpage en.romatsky.ua where you have uh, more analysis, more reports. You can go and share our stories in social media. That's what we encourage you. We are there working for you 24-7. As well, we encourage you to support Romatsky, donate. Uh, that's how we are sustaining ourselves. And uh, we are moving forward in the program for the next segment. <laughs> On the September 25th, uh, the new Ukrainian President Zelensky is going to meet the American counterpart Donald Trump for the first time. This is all happening on the eve of the huge scandal after a whistleblower said that U.S. President had pressured his Ukrainian counterpart to investigate the case of Burisma, a company where Joe Biden's son had worked. Biden is Trump's main opponent from the Democrats in the upcoming 2020 Ukrainian elections, uh, American elections. So. Uh, uh, there is quite a political issue. Uh, we earlier talked uh, and had a chance to talk to the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vadim Prestaiko, who at the moment of the call of Donald Trump uh, was working uh, with the President Zelensky as the deputy head of the President's office. Uh, Mr. Prestaiko claims that there was no pressure. That's his quote. I think that the situation that's taking place with the Americans between Ukraine and the U.S., this confrontation between Republicans and Democrats, all these speculations that Ukraine helped the Democrats, that we wanted a President Clinton instead of President Trump, this is a result of misinformation and evil intentions of certain people. We lost a lot of momentum of progress. Those who work in relations between Ukraine and the USA understood that we worked with both parties. We always valued the help from both sides, and our priorities won't change with relation to the U.S., regardless of who's in the administration. 
Different American presidents have supported us, and we value the support of Congress, but that doesn't mean we could or have the capability of, even in theory, of helping one or the other party. I want to say that we're an independent country. We have our own secrets. Our president has the right to speak to another president so that that conversation remains confidential. This is the one precondition that leaders set each other, so that they can exchange sensitive information. American investigators have the full right to turn to the U.S. and to get this information if they think that our president has been pressured. They can clear this up. I know what they spoke about, and I don't think there was any coercion. There was a talk. Talks can be on different topics. Leaders have the right to talk about any problems they wish. This conversation was long, it was friendly, and it touched on a lot of questions, some of which had rather serious implications. And we have with us uh, Mykola Kapitolenko, who is a member of expert board as a parliamentary foreign policy committee and as well the commentator of foreign affairs here. Uh, we are here to discuss a lot of other issues uh, which were discussed uh, regarding the uh, Ukraine uh, international relations and particularly in case of the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, but this is a kind of an urgent command, an urgent scandal. So what would be your say on the um, upcoming visit of the President Zelensky? What are these circumstances? What does it mean for the Ukraine-US relations? Uh, because there are hopes that you know, Ukraine can get an ally in, uh, let's say, moving the process of the conflict resolution with Russia. Well, recently there has been a common wisdom that Ukraine should stay away from political struggle within the United States. And I hope that the president will manage that. I don't think it will be easy, since too many rumors recently about all these speculations. I don't think there is no pressure from the White House at all. But I think there, there is a sustainable amount of pressure. So this will be an important task for the president. Meeting on, uh, uh, during the United Nations Assembly will be important, but not enough. We should uh, aim at the uh, visit of uh, President Zelensky to Washington, DC, or vice versa, to, to, to a visit of uh, Don Donald Trump to Kyiv in order to have a, a full uh, f visit of, uh, at the presidential level to discuss all the issues on the bilateral uh, agenda. In my view, we need a true strategic partnership with the United States based not so much on ideology and uh, on uh, appeals to values, but rather on pragmatic uh, long-term interests. And Ukraine and the United States have these interests uh, in a number of spheres, most importantly in uh, the sphere of regional security and energy security in Eastern Europe so we can uh, go together well. Uh, Makola, uh, we uh, gathered in the studio in order to discuss a bit different issue because there is another buzzword of this week, it's Steinmeier formula. This is the formula <coughs> more or less on the sequ sequence on how the Minsk uh, agreement should be implemented. But how you can explain to our foreign audience the recent development on this document? Uh, recently, this, uh, these two words have got uh, too much additional attention in Ukraine because the formula is about uh, concessions which should be made by both uh, <coughs> Ukraine and uh, Russia within the context of Minsk uh, agreements. Uh, in my view, the, the most fundamental issue is not about formula, but it is about the substance. Uh, this is basically about uh, who has to make first concessions. Steinmeier formula, to put it simply, is about who is controlling the eastern Ukraine, uh, the currently occupied territories, when uh, elections take place. According to Steinmeier's formula, that should be Russia. According to Ukraine's uh, position, that should be Ukraine. So debate is mostly about this. But this is a part of a broader debate. The broader debate is about um, the price, because any option we pick uh, has a price, either to uh, leave the conflict as it is, to freeze it, or to resolve it. All three options have some price attached, and Ukrainians, as it, as it seems, uh, don't want to pay. They, we want peace, but we don't want to pay for it. And uh, so far, this is the main reason of all political struggle, of all emotional reactions from Ukrainian politicians at various levels. Today they are uh, reflected in uh, debates around Steinmeier form formula. Tomorrow they may be reflected uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, ceasefire. Whether it is a victory or a defeat, we don't have a clear criteria actually for, for a victory. What, what do we understand by victory? And my last point is that we, uh, for some reason, believe that time is playing on our side, which is not necessarily the case. In particular, I just want to explain to our foreign audience that indeed the word Steinmeier formula are the most read, this is the most read 
article on our webpage and everywhere. Quite a complex term. Few people really understand what it means. And we had a chance to sit down with the foreign minister, Pristaiko, who more or less showed the document and explained what it is. And here is his comment. This document is one that was signed by two ministers of foreign affairs, that is Steinmeier from Germany, who's currently the federal president, and previously the German foreign minister, and French foreign minister Fabius. This text is that Steinmeier formula, which not many people have seen. In truth, it's just a clearly written, unambiguous version of the position of all sides in the Normandy format. Steinmeier came up with a simple idea. On the day that local elections are held, we're not saying which elections, under what conditions, whether there is demilitarization. These are all different questions which should be solved before the elections. We're right now talking about this short formula, and it says only one thing, that on the day local elections are held, the law on temporary special status for the occupied territories takes effect. And on the moment that the OSCE says that the elections were held honestly to the high standards of the OSCE, this status becomes permanent. That's all. There's nothing about, there aren't any more ideas, no one's talking about when Ukraine gets access to the border, or under what laws elections will be held, whether press will have access to the elections. This is all in the OSCE standards for holding honest and transparent elections. The formula itself doesn't have a word about that. People who think that way are just speculating. President Zelensky said that holding elections can only be possible when on our land, under our laws, and it was said a long time ago that all elections must be based on Ukrainian law, and all necessary conditions will be set, not by the foreign ministry, not by the office of the president, but by the hands of parliament and the Central Election Commission. They will be responsible for setting when, what conditions, whether there's enough security, whether there's enough funding, all of the organizational conditions so that the elections can be held and so that the will of the Ukrainian people on all of their territory in all regions can be sufficiently expressed by these elections. The full version of the interview with the new Ukrainian foreign ministry would be available later next week, the full translation, so we went into the details, and as well, uh, Mr. Prestaiko explained what he considers to be the Zelensky uh, plan and what will happen with the Normandy meeting, what are the conditions, so uh, stay tuned and follow and share and read in details. And um, we are going on to talk with Mykola Kapitolenko, who is the uh, Ukrainian political analyst in foreign affairs, you've written also the article, in particular why we are, we, we're talking, you've written an article about how you can use this Steinmeier formula. Um, so um, what are your, uh, you know, there are a lot of critics who say it's the time, you know, this team shouldn't rush. There are a lot of landmines. Uh, if uh, the team, speaking about the President Zelensky and uh, the U Ukrainian leaders, uh, that they would make a lot of mistakes if they would rush. So what are those risks? What would you consider? The basic problem, the most fundamental one, is that uh, Russia's negotiating positions are much stronger than ours. And that leaves them space for maneuver, and that leaves them uh, pretty easy to, to, to push forward any conditions they'd like, and then just wait. That is something we cannot afford, and President Zelensky can hardly afford because of his uh, prom promises before the elections. He made a trap, let's say, let's put it like this, uh, uh, for himself by promising peace. And now Russians have time on their side. They can wait, while Zelensky cannot. And when uh, Minister Prestaika says about uh, half a year or one year that we have uh, before we should get some result, this is also a sign, or not so, so much a sign of a weakness, but this is something which can be used against Ukraine as a leverage tool during the negotiations, because Russians do not have this time pressure. We do have now. And also, we are talking a lot about red lines. We are constantly pressing President Zelensky that he should draw some red lines in order not to cross them. And from different political sides, political, political forces and perspectives, these lines are pretty different. If we put all of them on the map, then he will not have any space for negotiations. He will have to stick to the previous, the safest position, which has been taken by President Poroshenko, that we are fighting against Russians and only will accept the peace on our conditions, which is not attainable at the moment. So uh, what do you think this discussion about the red, red lines? Uh, somebody said like that better should be the red flags instead of the red lines. Um, but what would you s maybe explain also how do you think it's seen in the society? To, it's cr really politicized. But how to deal with that? What do you think that should be done that uh, it just does, it, th that this discussion doesn't harm the process itself? 
usually those discussions anyway are the obstacles for the whole process. It can harm the process in many different ways. We, we are in a very delicate situation when any moves towards resolving or even freezing the conflict will uh, see the harsh critics from all sides. These, in, in theory, these critics are called spoilers, those who are not interested in the resolution of a conflict, they are not satisfied with the conditions, and they will press constantly, press politically the president and the team. So in my view, we should give more freedom to the president and his team in order to consolidate the position. We also should have, give them more time uh, in order not to make any hasty decisions which could result in mistakes. And we also should understand that the resolving the conflict in Donbas is a part of a much broader problem, which is our vision of future relations with Russia, a topic uh, about which almost nobody is talking seriously. Okay, we declared Russia to be a, a, a foe or even an aggressor, a state against which we are fighting a war. But let's say uh, what, how we, what is the most desirable uh, stance of our relations with Russia in, let's say, five or ten years or fifteen years. Are we ready to pay the price for a non-frozen conflict, which continues like today, when the shellings are taking place every day and people got killed? Are we ready to pay the price for a frozen conflict like the one we already have in Transnistria, lasting for more than 25 years? So this debate should precede, actually, implementation of any strategy of conflict resolution in Donbas. So in my view, uh, the last point which uh, Zelensky team needs from, from, from expert society, from civil society, from political forces, is to help him shape this debate about what kind of uh, Russia we are willing to have in the future and what will be the model of Ukraine's coexistence with our aggressive and very, I would <coughs> say, uh, risky neighbor. So the meeting in the Normandy Forum, uh, but on the uh, level of this head of state, uh, was planned, even was discussed. Uh, Minister Pristaika mentioned that it was planned for even September. Now it might be moved to the mid of uh, October, maybe later. Uh, the condition of Russia, what we understand, is that there would be some documents written uh, in the end of those negotiations. That would be the first of this kind of meeting. Uh, since the last three years. What do you also would say are the major obstacles, concerns, uh, risks as well? Because at the same time, sooner or later this meeting should have happened. Everybody would say you need to be prepared. But we understand that this preparation, you know, does it really matter? This is a two months preparation, three months preparation, four months preparation. There is something else. Uh, it's more about the relations between the leaders. Uh, let me for a moment uh, try to to feel myself in Russia's shoes and try to see the to understand the Russia's perspective how, how they see things uh, in my view what they believe in is that the key to the decision to hold uh, uh, the next Normandy summit is in the Kremlin's hand actually it depends on on the position of Vladimir Putin whether it will take place at all and they can wait again they can wait for another three years and then and for more three years this is uh, uh, the highest price is not, by, is not paid by Russia for this conflict. Uh, they have also some reservations. It seems like they do not trust uh, Ukrainian administration, be it previous one or uh, the current one. So they try to see or to test uh, how, how credible Ukrainian promises are. Why it was important to have this exchange of uh, detained persons not only because of emotional part, but also because it is an important first step in further negotiations. It helps build minimal trust for further concessions. Otherwise, each side trapped in security dilemma does not feel it is ready to make concessions first because of a fear of, of the other, what, what other party will do. This is crucial to any attempt, uh, successful attempt to establish a ceasefire. So the logic of the Kremlin is that, okay, we shall start with the prisoners exchange, then we'll probably proceed to cease fire, but we will require concessions, promises from Ukrainian side and del del deliberation. I mean, they, they, del they deliver the promises. And uh, so far this has been the most uh, critical issue because in, uh, in the Kremlin's view, uh, Ukrainian president, previous one, uh, has not always fulfilled what it promised. Uh, we can even see it from the interpretation of the Minsk protocol by Moscow. Now what they want is that uh, in, uh, they consider Minsk protocol to be fine. So they, they see that this as a plan for resolving the conflict and they are really 
ready to give Donbas away to Ukraine, but under certain conditions, under the Minsk Protocol in their interpretation. So what they will try to do is to move, bring us closer to, to this, to their understanding of Minsk Protocol. We should have had this discussion long ago, whether we actually are ready to pay this price, whether Ukraine is really ready to fulfill the Minsk Protocol in Russian's edition, meaning that we give autonomy to Donbas, we adopt the law on amnesty, on special status, uh, we hold elections, and then at the end we get the control of the border and Russian troops uh, leaving Donbas. This is what Russians will be insisting on. And regardless uh, any sh formulas, uh, no matter whose, and regardless uh, actually the number of meetings in the Nomadi format, whether the first one will take place in October, in November or the next year, this will be the essence of their negotiation position. And we have to understand that we'll have to deal with this. We will not be able to constantly trick Russians around or to somehow to play with these formulas, formulations and things like. We'll have to approach the essence of negotiations over Donbass and that will be hard. So Mikhailov, thanks for the brilliant analysis. I'm pretty sure that got you our audience got more clarity with that. Thanks a lot. And we obviously would look more on the issue and would follow the story. We are there 24-7, so go to our webpage, en.hromatsky.ua, uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and other platforms, uh, but as well sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's on the up, uh, top up, uh, in the top right corner of our webpage. <laughs>
Вот в этом столкновении, в этом массе людей я ее кинул в сторону сотрудника. Два дня меня продержали все в спецприемнике. И, конечно, я тогда еще не знал, что пока я даже уже находился в этом спецприемнике, на меня уже было составлено уголовное дело по 212 статье. В течение 10 дней происходит суд, и он определяет уже меры пресечения. Домашний арест, либо заключение под стражу. Ну, всем, всем дали заключение под стражу на два месяца. Я отправился в СИЗО. Есть восьмой округ, например, там аэропорт, Сокол, Коптил, по-моему, Войковский еще. Там кандидат от власти проиграл демократическому, реально демократическому, а не от КПРФ, кандидату Дарьи Бесединой от Яблока, ну, которая при поддержке Яблока шла. И после своей победы Беседина сейчас написала, что на первом же заседании Мосгордумы она будет требовать распуска Мосгордумы за ее нелегитимностью. Потому что это все происходило в условиях, значит, репрессий, разгонов митингов, недопусков кандидатов и так далее. И я считаю, что многие кандидаты должны это теперь делать. Дальше главной повесткой любого политика в России должна быть тема политических заключенных. Мне очень греет душу, на самом деле, что люди начинают понимать, что человечность имеет отношение к политике. И я, пожалуй, являюсь сторонником того, чтобы создать некий тренд на порядочность. Вот нужно дать людям понять, что если они говорят о правах человека, э, какие-то антивоенные, может быть, моменты включают в свою риторику, нужно понять, что тогда они получают нашу поддержку, они получают наши голоса. Все сферы замыкаются на политической. Ты можешь быть прекрасным врачом, который придумает лекарство от рака, но если у тебя в стране плохая политика, тебе просто не разрешат ввести лекарства для этого, ввести компоненты для лекарства, да, необходимые, скажут, что это наркотики. У нас, кстати, очень много дел таких уголовных. Ты можешь быть гениальным режиссером, там, театральным постановщиком, э но если у тебя плохая политика в стране, то ты сядешь, как Кирилл Серебренников. Мы должны изменить плохую политику, чтобы люди могли изобретать лекарства от рака, чтобы они могли делать хорошие постановки в театре, чтобы они могли быть хорошими журналистами, и чтобы им за это ничего не было. Я, я не хочу говорить банальных фраз, но... Фраза «это может коснуться каждого», она максимально подходит к этой ситуации. Поэтому нужно, чтобы ни митинги не утихали, ни протестное голосование не утихало. Потому что если сейчас все это остановится, то силовики, творящие вот это вот все, они скажут царю, наши методы работают. Видите, все утихло. Вот мы всех пересажали, запугали, наши методы работают. И они получат еще больше полномочий, еще больше финансирования и так далее. А если продолжать, продолжать просто стоять на своем, значит террор не работает. И с нами придется договариваться. Это если коротко. So this was a very intense week. Stay with us. Uh, we don't know. The next uh, week must be as well quite intense in this political season, not just in Ukraine, but in the whole Eastern Europe. So watch Hermask International and uh, stay tuned. And with this, I say you goodbye.